We have two challenging scripture readings today. The epistle reading contains what is probably the most explicit scriptural prohibition of women serving in the pastoral office, which these days, even in our conservative Bible teaching Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, can still make people look nervously over their shoulder to see if the culture is listening. And then, as if that were not enough, that same reading ends with the mysterious statement, but she will be saved through childbearing. Now, Scripture tells us that childbearing is a wonderful gift from God, that to give birth to children and care for them and teach them to know the Lord is a great good work. But it also says it's not what saves us. Then in our Gospel reading, we have Jesus telling a parable which is very strange, a dishonest property manager being condoned for some of his shady dealings and Jesus' hearers being instructed to take a cue from him. I propose to preach on both of these this morning, so it should be fun. (laughs) Let's start by reviewing the parable. The rich man receives a tip that his trusted steward, his factor, his fund manager, is wasting his possessions. At this point, we don't know if that's through carelessness or embezzlement, or even if the report is true. But it's significant that the manager does not try to contest the charges at all. And when we see how he acts through the rest of the parable, we can believe he was guilty of some malfeasance. The landlord calls him on the carpet and says to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. But he doesn't send a security guard with the guy to watch while he cleans out his desk and escort him out of the building. And so the guy has one last chance to do the kind of thing that employers are worried about when they send a security guard to escort a newly fired employee out of the building. Cook the books one more time, but not in the way you might think. Having received this terrible news, the manager is beside himself with worry. What am I going to do? After this, no one's going to hire me to manage anything. My work experience doesn't matter anymore. I'm too soft for manual labor, and it would just kill me if I were reduced to begging after being what I've been. What am I going to do? And he hit on an idea, a much better idea than recording a last-minute large cash transfer from his master to himself, which would have been very obvious and which the master would not have let stand. The steward is much cleverer than that. Summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. In this way, the unjust manager makes a friend out of everyone who owes his employer anything, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. Now, what is the rich man supposed to do about that? Everybody he does business with, everybody who owed him anything, is going back home singing his praises. Sure, they're going to be singing praises of the steward. Also, that's the whole point of the exercise. But they will have to assume that the rich man, the guy who actually owned their debt, was on board with this plan. They'll have to assume he at least let himself be talked into it. What a great guy. What a philanthropist. What a pleasure to do business with him. Now, is the rich man, when he finds out, is he going to break into these songs of praise and say, stop the music, stop the music. This is all a misunderstanding. I'm not nice, I'm mean, and I'm tight-fisted, and I kick puppies. Not likely. He has been painted into a neat little corner. Even if he could prove the fraud, and he might not be able to, because he wasn't keeping the books, it would be counterproductive to try. He would ruin his reputation, which right now is at a high point. So the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. All he could do is shake his head ruefully and say, well played, you scoundrel. It was almost worth all that money just to see such wheeling and dealing. Now this story makes us nervous because it doesn't have a traditional moral. It might remind you 
of some cynical movie you've seen, maybe about Wall Street, where no one in the cast is really innocent, so you have to pick your favorite character based on relative innocence, or maybe just how charismatic or clever he is. But Jesus told this story, so there must be something to it. The moral is untraditional, but it must still be good. What does he say? For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Now, the word generation here doesn't mean what we normally use it to mean, as in generation X, or talking about my generation. It's not a demographic group of people born all in the same 20 or 30 year time span. It doesn't refer to when people have been born, but how they have been born. The Greek word also, and more commonly, means race or family. That is, those who have sprung from the same origin, those who were generated from the same source. The sons of this world are a race. They are one race because they are born of the flesh, and the sons of light are another race because they are born of water and the spirit, born again in holy baptism. Two different worlds are being contrasted here, and two different races native to each. One native to the present evil world, and the other native to the life of the world to come, although they live in this world now. And this is the point where we're able to make an interesting connection to that perplexing line from our epistle reading. She shall be saved through childbearing. Not immediately obvious, of course, but let me walk you through the steps. The she in that verse is primarily Eve, our first mother, because that's who the apostle's talking about there. And then only secondarily, women in general, because he says she shall be saved through childbearing, and then continues, if they continue in faith and love, etc. It was Eve specifically who, as the previous verse said, was deceived by the serpent and became a transgressor. So this points us back to Genesis chapter 3. And we say in Genesis chapter 3, in the record of Eve's deception and the fall of our first parents, is there there some hint that perhaps this situation is going to be remedied and salvation is going to come through childbearing? And the answer is yes. In Genesis 3.15, as God is cursing the serpent right before he turns to lay the punishment on Eve, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed, the serpents, and her seed. What is seed? It's offspring. It's children. He, the seed, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God is talking about childbearing as the way to the solution to this trespass. One day a child would be born who would crush the devil's head, who would defeat him and undo his works. And the woman would be saved from the shame of having listened to the serpent by the glory of having given birth to God in the flesh. And Eve would be saved from her trespass. And all of us, her children, would be saved also. The seed of the woman who crushed the serpent's head is Christ, who suffered and rose for us. And it is because we are baptized into Christ, into that seed, the one who shared our birth according to this present world, that we get to share his resurrection according to the world that is to come. He became a son of earth to make us sons of light. Now, the dishonest manager in our parable is not a son of light. He's a son of this world, shrewd in his generation. And by that standard, he comes out of his predicament smelling like a rose. Now, that doesn't mean that all of your non-Christian friends are going to agree that he's the good guy in the parable or that he's admirable. There's still a lot of secularized puritanism putting starch into our culture. And especially if your neighbor happens to employ a money manager himself, he might not be able to get over that. But this guy is the very model of a folk hero. If the neighbor in question happens to have voted for Bernie Sanders, he might understand better. 
The unjust steward has made more friends than enemies, right? And the only enemy he could have made, the only guy he hurt, can take it. He can absorb the hit. And meanwhile, he's done good for all of these little people who needed help. Even the guy who he could have made an enemy out of is struck with admiration and probably doing his best to spread the rumor that the amnesty was his idea. And now there's a small army of his neighbors who owe him a big favor. This guy's like Robin Hood. Win, win, win. Everything works out. But Jesus sees a problem. That's why he starts talking about two worlds. The present world is passing away. And when it's gone, all those wins which have to do with the present world are gone too. If the sons of light are ill-equipped to play the crooked games of this generation, well, then the flip side of that coin is that the sons of this world are not prepared for the world that is to come. For eternity, a much bigger deal. But this is something Jesus leaves implicit. He is not interested in condemning the manager. The reason he tells this story is so that we can learn something from what he does. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. What does he mean by that? The unjust manager has full power over his master's possessions, but he takes unwise advantage of that position. He uses the mammon. He uses the money in an unrighteous way. He treats those goods as if they really belong to him and not his master. And then he gets caught in it. And the sudden crisis forces him to recognize the truth that he will have to give up everything that he has hitherto controlled, everything that he has defined himself by. It's not really his, and he has to give it up, not someday, but today. And in that moment, he has a real epiphany. I need to find a way to use this stuff, to use this stuff for permanent good, to use this stuff in this few hours while I still have the ledger. I need to do something that will be of good to me after I don't have it anymore. That's the part Jesus is pointing us to, because that realization isn't only shrewd, that realization is genuinely wise. And his condition in those frantic hours where he's trying to feather his nest is quite parallel to our own during the whole of this life. Do you have temporary possession of things that aren't really yours? I don't mean they secretly belong to your neighbor or your parents. I mean they actually belong to God. They're on loan to you. And you're not going to be here forever. Those goods certainly will fail. They will disappear, they will be used up, or if they don't, you will disappear, you will be used up. Do you have material goods that God has lent you? And not just things, do you have people that God has lent you? Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, children. And are you daily seduced into assuming that these things are really yours? and to loving the world and the things that are in the world, relying on them, worrying about them, striving with all your ability to increase them, and thinking of God only when they are threatened in such a way that you don't sure, you're not sure you can handle. Yes, of course you have. Of course you are. And me too. Every one of us does this every day. It's the air we breathe. But when you stop to think about it, nothing is more obvious than the fact that you can't take it with you. So what are you doing with these blessings now? While you still have the ledger, are you using them in ways that count for eternity, or are you more foolish than the dishonest manager? Having foreseen the great crisis, your own death, and the consequent loss of every worldly power and possession, are you doing anything about it? Shouldn't you plan for your eternal state with even greater care than the man in this parable planned for his surprise retirement? Shouldn't you be even less attached to your fleeting riches than he was when he realized he was about to lose them? And he called in people and said, quick, write down 50 instead of 100. 
No, really, do it. I'm actually cutting my losses by being so generous. I can afford to be incredibly generous with things that aren't really mine. There's the moral. There's the application. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. This is the preaching of the law, that everything that you have and even that you are belongs to God and becomes unrighteous when it is alienated from his purposes and usurped by us for our own selfish plans and perverse appetites. The only sane and righteous thing to do is to use them unfailingly to the delight of the saints and angels, to befriend the one who owns the only dwelling that we can call eternal. But we don't do that. And the owner of that eternal dwelling happens to be the same God who owns earth and all the things that we call our own. There are not, in reality, any smaller landowners that we can play against the great landowner. Under the law, our position is dire. But thanks be to God, there's not just law, but gospel. Thanks be to God, we are no longer children of this world, but children of the light true worshipers of God who trust in his mercy and not their own works, who already belong to that new world, that spiritual generation, that eternal habitation. The dishonest manager needed to get lots of people to like him because they were the ones who owned the houses he hoped to stay in in the future. But there's only one house that we can stay in after this life. And the one who owns it, Jesus Christ, is the one you have to befriend. But thankfully, he has already befriended you. Before you ever thought of loving him, he loved you. The one who is begotten eternally of his father became the seed of the woman and was born for us men and for our salvation. He managed the estate in perfect faithfulness and then died in your place anyway and rose to destroy the death that challenges you and threatens you. And he baptized you into his generation, into his family, into his body. So now, be the friend of God. Be what he has made you to be. Make good use of the things that God has loaned you for this life, for the advancement of his kingdom and the good of your neighbor, your time and your talents, as well as your more tangible possessions. Not because you need to wheedle your way into heaven and make friends of this one who has already loved you to death, but out of gratitude, as if you could in some small way repay him for what he's done. Since Christ, your benefactor, doesn't need your charity, serve his brothers instead. Make friends of them, since Christ is already your friend. Give, and especially forgive, with the same open-handed generosity that God has shown to you and you will receive much greater reward than anything you could actually merit. You can afford to be incredibly generous with things that don't actually belong to you. In the name of Jesus, amen.